I'm really privileged to be part of this lineup. And um, yeah, if you haven't donated yet, please consider doing so. It's we're we're all grateful for the amazing work healthcare workers are doing all over the world. Um, so I think uh, um, it's fair to say we're all into a bit of lockdown fatigue. Um, this is by far my favorite um, tweet uh, of the lockdown period. We definitely are moving into a new normal. Um, I have no uh, conflicts of interest uh, in particular to this presentation, but just to say that I have not done a single Joe Wicks uh, session yet during this period. So apologies, Joe, although he seems to be doing okay. And I don't think I could ever go vegan, mainly because of Biltong. So if you don't know what Biltong is, um, there's a trip to South Africa in your future. Um, um, as Michael mentioned, uh, I'm a South African who spent the last seven years in Dawa at the Aspital Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Hospital, which was an incredible experience. So uh, really grateful for all the work we did there and just recently moved to Dublin um, and excited about the work we're going to do with the Irish Rugby Football Union over here. Um, if prevention is something you're interested in, um, I cannot promote this conference uh, strongly enough. It's the IOC World Conference in Monaco, and it's been postponed until February next year. So um, it's great bang for your buck. And if you have the opportunity, I encourage you to go. It's, it's, always, um, it's always worthwhile. So this is by far my favorite Stephen Covey quote. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And I think it's important if we're going to talk about prevention in a sports and exercise medicine context. Because for most of our elite athletes, this is the goal. Winning World Cups, winning medals, breaking records. And we often think of this as a uniquely elite situation, but as an amateur triathlete, emphasizing the word amateur, I would say that Although I'm not particularly competitive, I certainly also want to compete. I want to participate and I want to improve uh, every time I do. So I think at all levels, even if we are a recreational uh, um, uh, uh, healthy exerciser, uh, we need to think about performance. Now, if we think about it from a performance context, what do we mean with prevention? I think if we look, think about general medicine, we've definitely come a long way um, uh, in terms of how we used to think. Um, and so smoking is an easy example. Um, it's taken a long time, but um, the momentum finally built because we were able to demonstrate this association and the solution was fairly simple, just remove the exposure. And it's worked. That's, that's been a very successful strategy, but that we cannot do that in sports. Um, we are actually doing exactly the opposite. We are purposefully exposing our athletes to the exposure that will cause or presents risk of injury. So in the smoking analogy, we're trying to figure out exactly how many cigarettes can you smoke before harm is introduced. So if, we're, if we know we're doing something different, I thought it would be worthwhile to just review what sports injury illness prevention looks like. Well, what have we done in the past uh, um, in our field? Now, I'm not going to explain every model, but in the past 30 years, there's been about 10 models that have kind of built and evolved uh, on the very first uh, models that were introduced in the 90s. So Willem von Mechelen, Mechelen with the sequence of prevention model, that's really a research model, and then Willem Mubis' um, multifactorial causation model. I'll just mention, the most influential paper recently, which is Natalia Bittencourt's complex system approach to injury. Now, Natalia will speak after me, and so we can let her really explain and, and dig into this um, in detail. But essentially, it's what we clinically experience. So we have these agents or factors that interact with each other. They form some sort of regularity. You can call that a risk profile, if you will. And that leads to injury adaptation. So it's really, it's, it's really clear that we we have to appreciate the uncertainty that comes with that and the complexity of how sports injuries uh, evolve, especially when we're trying to, to manage them. Now, um, Natalia is going to tell you about injury pattern recognition. So you can see that there's a pattern here. It's about 12 years for us to update or improve on our, on our models. And that strangely correlates with another pattern. Um, 
uh, it looks like it, it, it's good for a, a good marker for how the Springboks, the South African rugby team, will perform at the World Cup. Uh, so I don't know if it'll wait if we wait another 12 years for them, but I will wager a guess that the next team to win the World Cup will also be wearing green. So I know what you're all thinking. Do we really need more models? I think no. I, I, well, yes, right. So we we want to continue to understand how we 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 how injuries evolve, how they are caused. We want the research efforts to improve on what we know for sure. But as a clinician, I just want to have a really concrete way of managing the risk in my athletes. And I think that's where we're moving towards. Now, to my mind, um, although there's been great work by Colin Fuller and others, um, Andy McIntosh and Ruald Barr simplified this process for us with this publication in 2008. Um, and it's a four-step process, which essentially can be called a risk management program. So in, in step one, you're using your injury surveillance data to benchmark yourself against your league. So what, what are the risks in my team? What, what's normal? What should I expect to happen? Then in step two, um, we review what we're going to do in training and competition. So does the risk of injury change throughout the season? And can I determine that? In step three, what, we'll, what we've been calling our screening for a long time, or risk profiling, if you will, some more injury surveillance data at an athlete level. So do certain athletes have a higher or um, lower risk of injury? And then in step four, how are we going to do anything about it? The very important so what question. So if we think about this program, I'm going to look through this now and, and demonstrate where we have evidence and how we can apply this perhaps in a very practical way. So a good way to understand injury risk now or, uh, is the burden of injury. So back in 2017, uh, this publication demonstrates that it's not only incidence so how, of the frequency of something that's important, but certainly also the severity. So if we take ACLs, they don't happen very often, but of course, an enormous time cost associated with the most, ath most athletes will be out for at least a year. Where muscle injuries, well, they happen more often. Certainly hamstring injury is one of the most common injuries we see, but they don't take that long. So our approach, our risk uh, acceptance with these injuries will be different. We might behave differently if we're going to allow our athlete to engage with a certain level of risk. The other thing I think is really important, so this is from the UEFA injury study, um, really great work that's been done for decades now, um, but this allows you to benchmark yourself against uh, your team. So if you're thinking about muscle injury rates here, you can determine whether you're doing a little better or below uh, or above average and see whether that's something to reflect on and should be doing better. There might be reasons sometimes, but certainly don't wanna be uh, to the far right of this graph. So this helps us to benchmark ourselves and understand what risks are within the team uh, that we can expect. So then step two, um, does the risk change throughout the season? Now, I, I think it's important to mention the work of Tim Gabbett here. Um, uh, and this uh, editorial is available in BJSM. For, uh, if you haven't read it yet, I encourage you to do so. There's some concepts in here that's going to become really important in the next couple of months. And I think the work that Tim has done has really highlighted the relationship between workload and injury. Um, uh, and evidence of that is the number of publications that are coming out in the last 20 years. So it's an exponential rise in this. And every man and his dog has an opinion about this, of course, right? Because it, it, it is difficult. Um, now, if you want to have a balanced view of this, Franco Impelizzeri has done an excellent job of doing a very critical review. And then with Aaron and, and Alan has gone on to, to actually put that into formal research projects. But a really nice summary of their argument and the uh, highlighting some of the difficulties within uh, some of the concepts uh, in training load, especially the acute chronic workload ratio, is in this YouTube presentation. And I encourage you to go and have a look for, for, for those critical points. But as a concept, um, I think what Tim tried to demonstrate was, uh, and still does, is um, uh, we, and this is largely based on the Bannister fitness fatigue model. And it makes sense, right? So we wanna know how much can I push you 
what can I fatigue you in this week, let's say today, and how does that compare to what you've been doing or your fitness? So he suggested the sweet spot where your risk of injury is significantly lower. And if, you're, if your ratio gets uh, too high, you might go into the danger zone. Now, I um, can't not think of Top Gun when I hear danger zone. You don't want to be a maverick. Uh, and if you don't get that reference, um, this is a great opportunity to sign on to Netflix and fill that gap in your education. So we want to avoid the danger zone. And this acute chronic workload ratio might help us determine that. But as Tim himself has, noted, uh, has pointed out, you might just explain that by overall workload, your fitness. And this is, a, uh, I think, a very well-known fact in endurance sports. We certainly know that we work hard to expose athletes to enough uh, uh, workload to make sure we can fatigue them. Um, and in, you know, whatever happens in the next couple of months, as we return to sports, our athletes are going to either have this really steep on-ramp or this long drawn out process and we have to figure out how to make sure we expose them to workload and mitigate their risk of injury. I'll spend a little more time here um, in our athlete uh, risk factor analysis. So can I, can I pick out the athletes that have a higher or lower risk of injury? I'll plug the systematic review um, we've done recently um, uh, and all the credit goes to Brady Green. Uh, he has done an excellent job uh, of uh, collating um, a large body of evidence with his supervisor, Dr. Tanya Pizzari, at the Latrobe Sports and Exercise Medicine Research Center. So um, this is a really great overview of all the uh, risk factor do data to date. And what they found were not uh, surprising to a degree. So at least the usual suspects, right? So older age, uh, and you have to figure out what that means. Um, and then previous injury, previous hamstring injury. The interesting thing was that if that injury was in the same season, uh, your, your risk increased fivefold. So definitely keep an eye on those athletes in my team. Um, and there was also a strong association uh, with previous calf injury and previous ACL injuries. So yeah, you know, of course, injuries are linked. These athletes, Injuries are multifactorial and the uh, one injury might lead to another. So it really emphasizes the importance of rehab again. Now, um, I spent uh, the last seven years uh, doing my PhD in this area as well. And if I knew they were selling these PhD bars, I could have saved myself a lot of trouble, I guess. But um, we did do, I think, what is still the largest investigation into risk factors for hamstring injuries globally. Um, and this is largely due to the support of the doctors and physios um, uh, working at the clubs and federations in Qatar, um, especially the football clubs uh, and then also the colleagues at Aspatar. But we were able to look at a lot of data, so a large number of injuries. And I'm not going to go through all the, the findings here, but one of the initial findings that, that was really strong was eccentric strength. So your risk of injury increasing by 37% if you had lower eccentric strength. And now you'll notice, or the more perceptive of you might have noticed, it wasn't part of the meta-analysis findings. So let me explain that a little bit maybe. This is the distribution of eccentric strength normalized to body weight with a, a isokinetic test uh, on the x-axis. Um, and I think everybody in the world now understands what a normal distribution curve looks like. So those are the injured players. Now, these in blue are the uninjured players. And this is the difficulty. Uh, they completely overlap. So it would be very hard to find a cutoff point where I can assign a player to a definite high or low risk of injury group. And these continuous variables are, are difficult because there is so much variability uh, within our testing and within athletes that change throughout the season of course, and of course they do. Sometimes we are causing that change. We want them to change. So I can't tell if I test this player whether he'll be in the, in, in the injured or uninjured group. Now, if that's the case, I guess it begs the question, how do we interpret these findings? So there's a group finding, a significant finding, but we cannot extrapolate that directly to individual risk. Now, to answer this question, I'll turn to one of my favorite scientists from the Ron Burgundy group out of San Diego. 60% um, of the time, it works every time. Yeah, so I mean, the funny thing is we kind of think like that. 
there's an 80% chance of rain tomorrow. I'm pretty sure it's going to rain. That's, that's often true in Ireland. But there's also a 20% chance it won't rain. So if it doesn't rain, that prediction was still correct. Now, that's the first important part, I think, and it was well um, demonstrated in the 2016 US elections, um, uh, which Rod widely highlighted to me, because this was the prediction uh, moving into those elections. And this is an election year again. Hang on to your seats, guys. But uh, in that election, this prediction showed that Hillary was clearly the favorite, 70% likely to win. Is no, like Donald Trump would have to pull up some magic trick to get this done, right? So what does this actually mean? Well, it means that three out of 10 times, this would happen. Now we don't get to have that 10 times. We only get to have it once. And although there's a, little, a small chance of that happening, it's, there's still a chance of that happening. So I think we have to appreciate that when we interpret risk of injury, when we hear percentages um, as well. Um, now, if we think about our hamstrings, I'm gonna, let's say, the first thing we need to understand when we want to appropriate this is what is the chance of having a hamstring injury anyway? So in our population, and this is pretty solid, I think for most populations, it's around 11 to 15%. Let's take 11, that's one in nine or an odds ratio of one to eight. Now we'll take the likelihood from our paper, which was 1.37, that 37%, and apply that now to those odds. So one to eight becomes 1.37 to eight. So I won't make you do the math, that relative risk of injury takes that 11% to 14.6%. Because the absolute risk of injury is only a 3.5% change, right? So, so that's really important. So the relatively speaking, you definitely have to pay attention, but absolutely speaking, we might not intervene or might change our intervention uh, if we understand that. Now, this is called Bayesian inference, if you're not familiar with it. And that posterior probability becomes your new prior probability. So this is really tough for continuous variables like this. But where we have categories of previous injury, other previous injuries, age, we definitely can start to aggregate a risk profile for a player and then stratify risk across our team or for our individual athletes. And that's really important. I think that's, that's vital, especially if we're moving into a, um, an extended Olympic period, return to sport. How can, we, how can we understand which athletes in our team should we pay a little more attention to? Now, the million dollar question, I guess, are you gonna do anything about it? Now, I think first, just to say, if we look at our good old prevention pyramid, we have lots of evidence that we are and can do something about it. So um, from a rehabilitation point of view, we've shown in, in some of our work that if you do a really good job with your rehab, you are going to be able to lower the risk of injury. So we found our previous injury, like we did in the systematic review, as a risk factor in our first part of our investigation. But then halfway through, as we kept looking at the group, it disappeared. And what we realized that because the rehab everyone was getting in Qatar was, it was very uniform and, and um, were recruited into programs and protocols that were very similar um, and, and were keeping a strict eye on, that everybody got a good deal, let's say. So there are evidence, there's more evidence of this um, uh, from volleyball in Norway, and we're seeing how important rehabilitation outcomes are to, uh, as a tertiary form of prevention, to avoid re-injuries. Martin Wallen has shown us that you can, you can identify current statuses or the status of previous injuries and use that as a prevention method. So that does require some uh, um, intervention in terms of maybe training load or strengthening, but certainly able to, or he demonstrated as kind of a proof of concept study that that's, you're able to do that. And then at a primary level, uh, if we use the term vaccine that we're all familiar with now as well, we definitely have good evidence that, let's say for hamstrings again, Nordics uh, um, are effective. And actually on that point, um, if we keep at the primary level and, and, and think about that, uh, our friends from Denmark, so Lasse Isoy um, and, some, and the group in Denmark has shown that, uh, has looked at the evidence for uh, a bunch of things with muscle injuries. If you haven't read this paper, it's really, really nice to, uh, to see what we have out there. But they also looked at prevention. And so for a bunch of muscle injuries, we actually have stuff that works at a primary group level 
the FIFA 11 plus in football is definitely effective. For hamstring and groins, you have these specific exercises, Nordics and the Copenhagen groin exercise that are very effective. Um, and then calf injuries, uh, that's the one we're not quite sure about yet. So more work to be done there. But at a very primary level, there's definitely things we can do um, and where we can intervene. Now, um, I hope you can see this video. Just because you know what to do, doesn't necessarily mean you'll be successful. You need to understand the role of the stakeholders, the regulatory bodies, the athletes, expectations, perceptions, uh, the different components that will make our injury prevention uh, intervention fit uh, in a way that will be effective. Um, and if you can't see this video, then um, this guy is trying to shove his suitcase into the overhead um, unsuccessfully, but eventually gets a little help. So context is key. I think we have to understand that that will always influence our willingness to engage with risk. And if we will engage with that differently at different times of the season, different parts of an athlete's career, and for different athletes. So it's important to keep this in mind and some great work is being done in this space now as well. And then the last thing I'll say is, I, you know, we, we have to do this together. Um, I think it's really important to know that um, we're, and I think what we're experiencing now is definitely a, a more of a unified uh, feeling of solidarity. And we need to be able to maximize our efforts and share our knowledge um, exactly in this kind of way, uh, but also within our own system. So Paul Dijkstra uh, called this the integrated performance health and coaching model. Um, so you have the coach, he's, he's in charge, right? It's like he's going to be the, the main driver of performance. And then you also have a performance health management system. So when that athlete becomes injured or ill, then the, the leader in that space, usually our sports and exercise physician, um, but it might be a physiotherapist uh, um, uh, or, or even an exercise physiologist that's driving this process forward. So they become important and we're all part of that process. So I think it's really important to, to acknowledge that and, and be open and collaborative in how we structure our approach to managing the health of our athletes and minimizing or mitigating the risk of injury. So as a summary then, um, I really like this risk management program. I think it's practical and applicable to how we should approach uh, um, uh, prevention um, in the sports and exercise medicine context. So understanding our risks, uh, that's key. We cannot make bricks without clay. So quality data and injury surveillance is absolutely necessary. I think we can build good risk profiling and, and that's also only possible if we do good clinical monitoring. I think that's really vital that we move away from isolated risk factor testing to injury patterns and, and, and that means monitoring athletes throughout the season. Um, and then uh, I think we also need uh, action in, form, in the form of an integrated health performance coaching model. And remember, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So thank you for your attention and enjoy the rest of the conference.